Okay, hi uh, everyone. Uh, today we have uh, another uh, under the spotlight, and we have Jeanette Ekström from uh, I, I hope I pronounce it right from uh, Denmark, and uh, she is a senior information officer and proud librarian of the university library at the Technical University of Denmark. Um, she has been teaching students and faculty for more than 20 years and has coordinated the library's training and education services for many years. She's a passionate advocate for open science in general, and she likes to network and loves sharing knowledge and learning together with colleagues. She has all through her career been active in many different networks and library projects. And her motto is always take an interest and be curious about all that has to do with developing our profession. Okay, Jeanette, we are so curious to hear you talk about open educational resources and your path to it. Yes. Let's start. Especially the path, because I'm still new to open education, I believe, but but I'll share my screen now um, and then we'll just take it from here and uh, I hope we can get some dialogue afterwards. So am I seeing hopefully some things in a minute? Can you see yeah, my screen? And we now? already love the open. Sorry? We already love the open. Love the open. Good. So I just need to remove you because uh, I am sort of out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think this was under the spotlight. I was supposed to use that. So just you have seen that now and I'm under the spotlight. And uh, if I talk too quick, well, um, that's just how I do stuff. So sorry for that. And and. And um, when I was asked about this, I, th I thought I had lots and lots of time to sort of prepare a lot of stuff and, and, and then all of a sudden, I mean, today appeared. So, and, and, and in one way or another, I still feel that I'm failing you to sort of the concept of open education resources, even though the reason why I'm interested in it is because I feel that it's the same kind of things that we struggle with when it comes to open access to publications, to you know, open science in general, to, to you put, putting information forward. And the idea from a librarian's point of view is also that we, we like everyone to sort of have access to the information that is available out there. And, and with the new digitizations and stuff that's not new, but has been taking place in maybe 30 years already, um, it's not always as easy. And open education is just another way of sort of dealing with open in general. Um, so, um, my outline for the next 30 minutes is a bit, who am I? How did I end up here? And also set it in the scene for the Danish context. Um, but also um, what I see is, you know, the path that I have taken, but also why I think national, uh, national collaborators and international networks is important. And I will come back to how I sort of ended up being and taking part of this NOL, but I'm so happy that I actually got it. And you, is my internet unstable? No, hopefully not. So, so that's actually the outline for the next 30 minutes. Um, I myself is, as, as, as Monique said, proud librarian. Uh, I'm a senior information officer, but that's just had to do with the wages I get. But I'm still a librarian in heart. And I was educated back in the 1990s for. Uh, and during my four years at the Royal Library School, I never heard of anything called the internet. So it was fairly new to me when I came out uh, on the other side of my education to sort of hear about stuff like that. And I, the last year of my, my work, I worked at the road directorate in the archive doing lots of stuff that had to do with the legal things, supporting the transport ministry and stuff. Um, but but then very quickly I saw a, a position at the TO Library in 1995 and I've been here ever since. I don't think I'm stuck and old fashioned, 
important and I know that you should change job, but I love being at DTU. I've loved working here since, yeah, many years ago. And it's always been something what I've done has been to do with teaching and outreach and being out where the students are to help them to find the information, get the right searching, you know, in place and help faculty to do the same. So, so, so what actually is what I thrive at is, is being that supportive function uh, that can actually help them to get uh, to the results much easier so they can focus on studying and doing the research. And I've been fortunate and DTU has actually had a tradition to have many projects over the years, all these years that I've worked there. And I've been fortunate as many other colleagues to participate in these both national and international library projects and others. Uh, uh, and the focus in my point of view has always been what can we do as a profession, librarians to become wiser and more skilled so we are ready for when the questions are arriving. So that's kind of my drive. And then many years ago, I took a master in library and information science because I thought I needed some you know, extra theory to sort of put in my head uh, that I could sort of put on when I was out in, in faculty meetings and stuff. And at that time, I got sort of more into open access um, and and then how the ball kind of rolled that got me interested in is open the right way or what should we do and how can we accommodate that and it makes sense when you talk about it on paper that open access is to benefit society so that everyone can access it and not just those behind a paywall so that's kind of who I am and as I said I work at DTU library but that's only one of the many libraries or many universities in Denmark and this is sort of a, a picture of these eight universities to set the scene what we're dealing with in Denmark we have these eight universities we have uh, four in the Copenhagen area, uh, DCU, Copenhagen University, uh, Copenhagen Business School and IT University. And then we have Roskilde in the mid part of Zealand. You can see here, we have the uh, southern part of Denmark, University of Southern Denmark here in Odense. We have Aarhus University and we have Olbo University. And all these different universities is not the only one. We also have business schools and, and business academies. We have university colleges and stuff, but I just pitched out the universities. Already back in the 1990s, uh, something we 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 in Denmark had a strategy, and that strategy was to make it seamless with access to the electronic information that popped up back in the 90s, and at that time the ministry had actually a sort of now we're going down memory lane called the uh, deaf and that was because of uh, um, a big sort of a strategy from the government's point of view that Denmark should be an information society to benefit the Danes so everyone has access to the electronic information when it was electronically the internet was growing and you know moving up and and everyone was sort of publishing online so so could we do anything that will benefit so it's easy access instead of having to bike to a university library to get access now it was electronically available so we we went digital at that time and the digital transformation happened and that actually benefited the research libraries too because they saw an option and an opportunity to sort of work together across all these different universities and university platforms and then a project kind of thing started that called it was called DEF the Danish uh, electronic research uh, library uh, association kind of thing and that was a project in the beginning and it was sort of evolved into different things and we could apply for funding for bigger projects across the different organizations and the Danish community or the research library community benefited from that and I've taken part of that journey all the way through because I started in 1995 at DTU and, and we have seen that from our library's point of view, and we have joined it also. And, and it's been everything from, you know, creating uh, different subject guides in the old days when the internet was small and, you know, you could actually uh, yeah, take a whole look, look at, at the whole thing um, until today or the latest projects, which ended seven years, five years ago, maybe when Dev it was ended, uh, which was all about RDM, research data management and fair data and citizen science projects and this kind of thing. So it's evolved over time. And it benefited all these research libraries. So, so people working in libraries, maybe we are more, I don't know, 
yeah, yeah, we are staying in the same organizations, many of us for many years, so we know each other and we also have been working with each other. So the network is actually there already. We also have in the research um, organizations or research library, something called the Danish Research Library Association, and that's lots of sub networks there. You can see this is in Danish. I'm sorry, we haven't had it translated, but we have these different sort of networking groups, flipped being for training. Uh, and learning and, and teaching of students. This focus has been there and I, I participated as, as a chair of the board for, for that, that group for, for 10 years. Uh, maybe now that is five years ago that I ended that. But we also have focus on electronic resources, you know, licensing negotiations. We have the metadata that is important, RDA format and stuff. We have uh, copyright, which is a forum for communicating copyrights uh, the best way. Uh, and then we have marketing, you can see here, and then we have this one, which is uh, for the support for researchers, uh, all the services that we do. So, so there's different networks and different focus, and we meet two or three times a year, or not all of us, but some of us do, and we still network. So the network is important to me. I've always benefited from this network, and I also hopefully took a lot of interest and in part of these networks. So. That was sort of the setting the scene. Denmark is a small country. We, in the research library community, lots of us know each other already. So, so, so there's actually a ground there for, for learning and sharing knowledge, even though we work in different organizations. I work at DTU, uh, a great innovative place. And they have actually, since uh, Hans Christian Oerse actually founded that back in the old days, uh, had a focus on on developing you know new things that has to benefit the society so so the idea of open is actually not far off as long as it's within the legal frameworks right so the mission is that we develop and create uh, through technical and natural sciences that's my work and that's how the library also acts so the library that i work in is also doing the same thing to live up to dtu's mission um, and our um, um, Strategy is also to benefit society uh, as a whole. So, so, so that's the whole focus in, in what we do when we do stuff in the library too. Of course, it should benefit this you as well. That's sort of the timeline of how it happened. So we are actually the second oldest university in Denmark, Copenhagen University being older than us. And uh, it was founded back in 1829. And then it sort of moved from Copenhagen, smaller rooms to evolve, or sort of it was evolved and elaborated over and moved to where it is today in Lyngby, the main uh, campus. And then in uh, 20, uh, 2001, we became an independent and self governing university, meaning we have a board and we have uh, industry taking parts of it and all this. And then we have been merged uh, over times with other organizations, national research institutes like DTU Aqua, uh, DTU Food. So all this research is also now part of DTU. And then the final merger we had was with the Copenhagen University College in Engineering, where we normally educate the diploma engineers. So now they're also part of DTU. So it's a big machine, DTU, and we support as much as we can. We are uh, 13,000 plus uh, full-time students uh, divided into these different uh, educations. Uh, and then we have about 5,800 uh, employees divided into both researchers and educators, uh, support functions like me from the library and my colleagues attending today. And then we have PhD students. And this is from the annual report in 2021. Uh, so maybe the numbers are a bit different today. And the locations is also funny because, of course, we're located in Denmark, in Lyngby, where the main, you can see here, the main campus, but we also have the diploma in Ballarat. We have uh, research in Riesö, which is also the, used to be a nuclear facility, now it's not. And then we have different sort of uh, test facilities in Jutland. We have different collaborations all over Denmark and Bornholm and the, yeah, in in Lolland and stuff. So, so there are many places we we have, and we oh, so that was too quick. And we even have a, a sort of a campus on in Greenland as well. So it's kind of all over the organization, which we are from the library's point is supporting is this all these different departments, the centers, and then we have some uh, companies affiliated. But what you can find the library is in the support function. So we're not an independent organization, the library in DTU. We are part of research, advice, and innovation. So the library is an office, and we do 
what we have to do according to the strategies and all the the annual reports and stuff that we that we have to support the library is looking like this so to the left you can see sort of a very brief organization we have the head of libraries Gita, and then we have three teams and i'm in the middle team research support and and this is just some of the keywords for some of the stuff that we do so it's a mixed function of about 43 people i think we are right now uh, doing all kinds of stuff we don't have a focus on open educational system as a con or some open education re uh, sources as a concept but it's sort of implemented in all the other things we do on copyright and support and on training and teaching so it's the way i see it right now but we might want to look at it differently uh, in time we have a lot of focus on being electronic and being ready for the end user using them wherever uh, and did you find it is um, our big sort of library discovery tool where we put all the subscribed material, all open archives material, we can get metadata wise, books, ebooks, reports, uh, papers from students, their master's thesis, everything we can put in and make available in one search we put into d find it and find it is something we develop in-house so it's not a commercial tool we have uh, bought access to sort of like the the frame of that it's something we have done ourselves and as you can see here in the bottom we have system development and maintenance of these systems as well in our library fortunately enough still so, so we have a lot of focus on, you know, being the gateway to knowledge and innovation at DTU, but we're still also a public library, so you can see to the right industry and public is also vol welcome, so they can come in and use our tools uh, as much as they like as long as they come, but that's not open, so that we can't make it open everything for everyone on the other side, so how can we do it better. All the things that we do in the library and also the, the road that I'm taking towards all this you know, experience that I have in all these years is, is we have now tr tried because of find it where we get lots of metadata and because of what we do on open access and open science, we have a focus on two specific tools uh, should maybe have taken an extra one with but uh, not today. But DTO Orbit is where is our institutional repository. That's where we register all research output from our uh, researchers and faculty. And then DTO Data is where the data linked uh, to the publications can be sort of stored if they don't need a specific uh, data repository uh, for that. Then we have a container for that as well. And all these, both the data set here from DTO Data and the DTO Orbit with the publications is searchable in DTO Find. So, so, so a lot of that is sort of hung up on open science, the landscape that is presented for faculty. Um, we do a lot of support and outreach and training and events uh, also in our library, but mainly the library has a focus on the students, um, sort of like a training facility for them. Um, so, so all this that we do for when it comes to open is sort of regarded about open science or connected to open science and the agenda on open science in order to sort of live up to all the demands that the researchers are met with. And in Denmark, we have a national strategy for open access. It's green, so there's not a pile of money. So that means that the researchers can publish wherever they want. The academic freedom is for that, so they can choose to go for whatever journal they like, and they also they go for where their peers are, so they can get the citations. It's important also. But the green means that they have to sort of keep another version, a parallel publication, post-print version, they can upload to Orbit and make that openly available within an embargo period of time or immediately. And um, that is because there's not an extra money involved in getting, you know, to meet the open access demands in Denmark. So the green is what we'll go for. If they can't, you know, live up to that, then they can choose golden open access as well. They just need to find the funding themselves if they choose to, you know, publish in plus one or scientific report, which is some of those journals that are being used fairly much at DTU for open uh, for open access publishing. But we don't have a pile of money uh, centrally at the university. 
So the green is what we go for. We normally sort of juggle around the three different colors, uh, green, golden, and hybrid. And the hybrid now is sort of a mix max of also these transformative agreements that is popping into um, in the libraries. We have uh, agreements with Elsevier and Wiley. and means that um, in most cases, our researchers can publish for free, free um, um, because it's paid for with sort of the traditional subscription model. But then there's another sort of lucrative way of, of um, publishing with these transformative agreements. But the green is normally the free version. That is what we aim at if it's possible. It's not always possible, but that's another issue. So the national strategy has have lived for many years now. Maybe it will undertake a revision uh, soon. But it, it, the idea at that time when it came out was that in 2025, which is very soon, 100% uh, of all peer reviewed should be open access. And uh, that's a lot. And that should be open access with green open access. And it's not really doable. Uh, so, so some of these issues is, is some of the things that we struggle with. And how can we accommodate that? And the ministry even measures these away productions. You can see this is the red line here. It's actually DTU. And we are not in the lead. You have IT University, but they only have 100 publications a year to sort of reach the almost 100%. And we have about 3,300 or something publications a year. So we are about 77% open access as of this year. And if we in three years time has to be meet 100, it's fairly difficult. So this is what we're up against. This is the journey that I've taken. So and we are not there yet, but now we are talking about how can we make other things openly available, right? And we're talking about citizen science, we're talking about RDM, we're talking about fair data. Maybe hopefully this will benefit more and maybe reach the end goal or success uh, quicker than open access has because it's been a long journey with open access and communicating and advocating about that. But but uh, but this is the next things that the libraries are helping with in Denmark, not just DTU. Um, so we can say that open science is the practice of science. Maybe I heard someone saying many years ago that open science is just science done right, but it's all about transparency and accessibility, uh, accessibility to this knowledge that can be shared. And that's why I think it's quite easy to sort of move from that. I do so much teaching and we have lots and lots of students that are fortunate at our universities in Denmark to sort of get access to the information because we have it in subscription. And in our university, many of the students are actually using scientific articles or uh, ebooks that we actually can get in subscription for them to use while they are having a call. Uh, or taking their education. So they don't really ex see these open textbook as an issue. They just need to have access. Um, and when we talk about open educational material, it's another sort of way of approaching that. And then um, when I start sort of gotten interested in OER, it was kind of like during COVID, I got an email, maybe by coincidence, maybe by, I don't know, um, plant mistake, I don't know, but but there was a, a head of section from the Royal University uh, in um, the Royal Library in, in Norwich University that uh, added me to an email uh, list of uh, maybe these two open networks or NOL and LIBA working group uh, about educational resources would be interested for you because you have, uh, you know, shown interest in this before and that's how I kind of gotten into it so I got into it maybe at OER is also the new things we need to look into and also when I'm thinking about my own sort of the questions that we get uh, Casper, one of my colleagues is attending today and he and I together with another librarian and two legal advisors are actually at DTU having a group, a copyright group, because we benefited from the, the, the fact that we are now part of a, an administrative organization and not just uh, our, our own uh, library. So we can sort of get the synergy effects on working with the legal aids quite easy. And we have this group, copyright groups, and many of the questions we get is in regards to how can I make this openly available? Am I allowed to make this openly available? All these kind of questions that comes in, can I, I have a wiki, uh, it's behind the uh, login, but we want to sort of make it available for everyone. Can we just put it up? And then we're just saying, no, 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 let's come and talk and see what we can do. So you can actually make it openly available. So all this has to do with communicating and, and being you know, um, out there in the fields, knowing what is happening in our local settings. So when we talk 
talk about this. So, as I understand, and being new to OER still, um, I think that it's worth looking into because I think maybe it could be the next thing we need to be more aware of. And it's all about the teaching material, the learning material, and also the research material. And I think we have we have a sort of an understanding about how we can access the research material. I mean, if it's open access, you can use it in teaching, right? Uh, if it's not open access, you might be able to get it through a, a, a paywall uh, access, and then you can use it in your teaching if you link to it and the students get it themselves. So all this is, is okay. But the teaching material, the slides, the quizzes, maybe the learning objectives and all this, is, is not always openly available in, in, in a way that people have thought about it with a an open license. So, so it might be lying there, but we're not sure what we can do with it. So, so we need to consider that. And, and this is something that triggers me when I'm getting into how can we communicate this better? And when we talk about sort of the, the plethora of open uh, for, for, for teaching, it's huge. There's so many things. It could be everything from textbooks to videos to podcasts to whatever. Um, and, and we have to sort of dig into one thing. And when in regards to all these nice toolkits that we have in this network, uh, when I look at this, how can we actually go out and advocate to the teachers? Some of the things is, you know, using some of these toolkits that is actually available. And that I will also, you know, teach my colleagues when we start looking at it in in-house at my university library so as i see it oer there's sort of two directions as libraries we can go we can be what we do right now we can support an advocate uh, do some advocacy so we can get more and more sort of familiar with the possibilities and then they can decide themselves we are talking about academic freedom a lot in Denmark, and I don't want to push anything to the researchers they have to decide, but they have to do it on a sort of a, a, a good uh, base uh, knowledge uh, about what they can do and cannot do. And the other way is that we can practice ourselves. That means that we can go forward, put in a CC BY license on our material, make sure that it's actually uh, available under a, a useful uh, uh, license, if that's it. And that is leaving me or letting me go forward to all this. I mean, I didn't believe when I became a librarian that I would have to know a lot of legal stuff. But during my actually my ex, my, my, my training and education back then in the 90s, I got aware that the there's a lot of things that has to do with copyright and legal rights and all this. So, so we do need these and we do need to communicate them because it also protects the creators. And in Denmark, we have a copyright law uh, and it actually protects the creator no matter what. And then we know that when they have created something, then it's theirs. But in many cases, when we are dealing with publications, they're signing off a copyright transfer agreement and then the publisher owns it. And then you are, if you're lucky as a teacher, you might be able to, to use your own material uh, again. So all this is, is some of the trouble that I think we're dealing with. It would be much easier if everyone just knew what they were doing, putting a, a, the right the open license or creative uh, commons license for it. And when I was sort of, you know, getting more and more familiar with what I believe OER is, I discovered this one. I mean, there's a, an expert called David Wiley, and he has these five R's uh, that uh, he means that it's, it's his opinion that he believes is what sh we should be living up to if it should be openly available. And that's retaining the information, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And there's actually only two licenses that is fully living up to that. So you can see this uh, illustration and you can have a look at that yourself. And I think maybe this is what we should look more into to is that something we will is it something our uh, faculty or teachers will uh, do they actually want to share or not and we don't really know but we help them as long as we can or as much as we can when they ask us how to sort of live up to this and how not to infringe others copyright and that brings me to DTU because at DTU we have local guidelines for this. We have local guidelines for the teaching material, and it still means that the, those who created the material are, are sort of having the copyright for that material, but the rest of the sort of the, the faculty in that department still have the user right 
uh, usage rights to that material. And the, one of the reasons for that is that if that person that has the copyright leaves and the course is still running, we need to sort of be able to finish that course. So there's different options about that. So we have locally different uh, guidelines for reuse. And also when it comes to video production, you can decide to make it publicly available and all this. So we have policies for that as well. And that should hopefully help, but we need to go out and communicate. And I know Casper does that quite a lot. And I am also doing that uh, sometimes. So, so we need to be out in the field and teaching faculties how to do that. And even, I mean, the we have this um, um, portal called Teaching Legally. Um, and, and in there, we can see all the things that has to do with how you can teach legally according to the law. Um, so, so the Danish law is also sort of being communicated in this portal in a more popular way. And it's it's presented by, by um, UBVA, which is a association of academics uh, in Denmark. Um, so our uh, sub um, committee for that. So, so all this is something that I have worked with for many years, Casper and others have worked with, and, and this is a way of sort of becoming more aware of it. But I have not, until I sort of entered this network, thought of it as an OER per se. So, so it's just something we did to make sure that no copyright was infringed and everyone sort of got their right um, in, in that way. So. At many universities in Denmark, we have these LMS systems. I guess other places have that too. And that means that every teaching material is shared with the students in our tool called DTU Learn. And in that tool, uh, people can access everything that is in the course that they have signed up for. But when they stop having that course, the material is not available anymore. And that is when I start thinking, can OER help here. And we haven't considered that, I think, enough yet, because we don't have a repository for OERs in my university. We have different sort of background where you can get access to some of it, but still only if you are attending the course. So, and then we have these videos. Um, I have uh, this error here because this one used to be an open video uh, where there was lots of things that wasn't legally correct. So, so it's shut down now and it's moved to something else. And this one is an ER, but not an OER, because it's actually something you need to log in to get access for. So, so this is also a way of sort of dealing with not infringing copyrights, but making sure it's openly available for those who have a login, but it's still not available for everyone. So all this gives a lot of question and not really an answer. So, so where are we and where should we move? And that some of the things that, that uh, could be fun is actually to take it up to see what can we as libraries in Denmark or whatever help to, to make it better. And that's the inspiration that I got from all the networking collaborations. For instance, all these things that I have heard and, and participated in and seen and followed and read uh, in these two networks, both this one in OL, but also the Deeper Education Resource Working Group. Um, so, so what happened here is is the sort of the, the European picture of what is happening. And we in Denmark has a smaller group, and I will come to that in, in a few seconds. But but we think that there's a difference between how OER is handled in France in Sweden and in Denmark. So there are differences and these differences, how can we make them more locally so they fit uh, the purpose in that local setting? I know information is worldwide and international, but the fact is that the, the, the copyright policies is not always in line with that. So because of these two European networks, me participating there, I saw some of my good friends and colleagues from other organizations. Um, and uh, lately, last uh, October, we had a big uh, annual conference in, uh, in this Research Library Association Network, DFFU Summit, we call it. Uh, and in there, I had a, the privilege to speak 40 minutes and to, to create a discussion about open educational resources, a bit of theory, but mostly in practice, what do we do? A bit like what I'm talking about now, all the things that we know from open science world and open access world to how can we help to sort of transform that into some open educational resources? Because the open science 
mostly benefits researchers uh, or annoys researchers, you could say. But open educational resources might benefit everyone who wants to learn lifelong learning and all these ideas that UNESCO has and, and other big uh, organizations worldwide has and live up to the SDGs on uh, education, lifelong learning and stuff. So so maybe it's something we should look into also. So maybe open repositories should be a way forward. I'm just yeah, planting some seeds. But I had that uh, small discussion with a group of people attending that uh, um, um, that talk. And that met the, this four of us. This is uh, Kirsten from the University of Southern Denmark. And this is Penilla from Aarhus University and Solvay from Aarhus University and then me. We started having sort of an, uh, after having these NOL meetings, we met up um, two or three times also a year online to sort of discuss what is happening in Denmark and to share some knowledge. There's not a formal group in Denmark looking at OER, but we created a small informal group. And because of the speech that I had in uh, October, we decided to make an article. So, so where we talk about uh, that OER is in Danish, I'm sorry, but OER is free and equal access to teaching and learning material. We need to talk about this, how to do it. So, so it's sort of a, a, a debate uh, article that is on its way. It's still in press, so it's not published yet, but it will be available here, as you can see. And it doesn't mean that because we have had all these deaf projects uh, because of these uh, strategy in Denmark about information society to benefit Denmark as a whole and being digital, we have had lots of examples of OERs. We have Learning Lib, which is a platform produced for library teaching material and shared uh, for students, but also a sort of supplementary called Stack, which is students' academic digital competences, which is more the that the didactic approach about it. And then we have all our websites, we have LibGuys, so there's lots and lots of things that's actually out there. So why not use that to the benefit? Because I can tell everyone at my university about how to conduct a nice search strategy. But I think there's not so much difference if Kirsten is doing the same in the southern part of, uh, of Jutland uh, or in the SDU uh, university setting, or if Solva is doing it in Aarhus. We are talking about Boolean operators. We are talking about all these basics. So, so why not share? And that's the idea with the Learning Lib mission is to share these OERs so we don't have to invent the wheel all the time. It's a Nordic um, um, sort of community right now. So we have people from Norway and Sweden also attending and then Denmark. So it's a growing community, but it used to be a Deaf project uh, paid for by funding from the ministry. Now it's being paid for by, by the participants to sort of live up to the ideas and the mission for that. And the Stack platform being also a project, it has a second version, but it's sort of integrated into the big university libraries, Aarhus University, RUC, and the Copenhagen University, as well as the Royal Library, which is in an organization wise, library organization wise, one library today. Um, so. We have these lip guides uh, and uh, they all, I mean, around the world are creating lip guides, right? So why not, you know, reuse and do them in some way, having a license for that? Um, we don't support EndNote at my university library, but we have users using it. So I uh, do not mind sharing a link to the uh, University of Southern Denmark, their lip guide on EndNote, because I know it's thorough and it, it, it's good to use. So, so why not uh, be more aware of this as well? And then of course we have all these well-structured websites I'm almost done. So, so my journey, you can say, is how can we make sure that we don't invent the wheel again and again and again in library settings? Because it's not that unique to do teaching in information literacy or information searching or whatever. You might have different possibility and sort of angles towards how we want to communicate it. But if we have the material openly available for inspiration, even ourselves uh, in the libraries, then why not also communicate and advocate for that for the teachers if they also know where to get new ideas and inspiration in all these OER uh, collections that is actually available uh, around the world. Uh, mainly perhaps in the US, there's lots of big of these collections, but, but we might also discover that there are lots of things in, in Europe and that's why the NOL network is actually good because we are sharing that knowledge among each other if we know that there's things that exist. So my journey, 
is um, from open science or open access actually to open science also communicating it being an advocate and i think all the network that I have at DTU with all the different teachers that is booking us for, you know, embedded teaching all the time, we should benefit from that. And I have talked to my management and they have actually agreed because of all this that I've been talking, maybe I'm talking it up, I don't, don't know what, but we actually now have a smaller in-house project at the library uh, that will sort of start up right now uh, that will go out and sort of track the potential interest in OER among our departments and faculties and then maybe collect what is actually happening of existing. I mean, we know that we have all these videos, but can they be made openly available? We know that there are a lot of uh, um, um, syllabus uh, also information without licensing. Could that also be made available in some way? We put lots of open textbooks into DTU, find it not necessarily textbooks that we have created ourselves at DTU, but we have tracked from, from all these open textbook collections. So, so doing more awareness is, is that uh, the idea of this smaller in-house project. And then maybe we want to map what actors are actually working on it. I mean, I've talked a lot about one of the necessities is perhaps getting an understanding of copyright. You shouldn't infringe anyone's copyright, but if you don't put in a license on it, you always have to be asked if people can use or reuse your material. So in that way, maybe we can make it easier or the teachers can make it easier for themselves to sort of add a, a smaller uh, CC BY license for it if they want to share it uh, with the world. We should not decide that they should, but we should actually encourage them to, to look into the options. And we know that there are people, teachers at our university creating MOOCs and wikis and there are a lot of videos and streaming and education materials why not uh, discover what is actually out there so, so that's the idea with the project and then hopefully at the end we will have a sort of a strategy on how we in the library could get, gain some skills uh, to help them so it's not just focusing on copyright and getting access but also you know curating the information in another way so my route to OER is still a journey. Uh, I'm not. Um, I've not reached the end goal. I might be an experienced librarian, but I'm still interested in all the new stuff. Uh, and I believe that OER is something we need to look into also in a Danish context. That's why this piece uh, is is hopefully soon out to make some uh, noise and, and maybe get someone to say that it's something we should prioritize uh, into uh, connected between our university libraries uh, also um, in the future. So the end. So I just have to say thank you for uh, the, your attention and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm not sure that it was new, but it's yeah what I yeah thought I would share with you today. Um, my email is there, and you can always contact me or some of my colleagues and 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 be, yeah no more. And I've reached my time, I think. So thank you all. Thank you all, Jeanette. Uh, it was a very clear story. Um, <laughs> you've told such a lot. <laughs> I'm still dazzled. <laughs> um, uh, it is a bit of a discussion in uh, in Holland. We are also a small country like yours, so I feel very connected. Uh, is um, is open education uh, just a sub um, concept of open science or a movement uh, of its own, in your opinion? I, I don't know. I don't know. I think as as. But when um, what, in the early days, when when the if you know the EU project, the Foster project, they sort of outline a taxonomy about open in all different areas. There's lots and lots and lots of open in in sort of a taxonomy with different sort of uh, arms all over all over, with everything from open peer review to open data, whatever. Open education resources not mentioned at all. So I think either they forgot at that time when they were sort of tracking the taxonomy of that, or maybe it's just something on its own. And I think all this that has to, in my opinion, all that has to do with open science has a focus for the researchers and the research communities where open educational resources is the training and it's the students and the access for students. And, and during COVID, all this, we experienced that 
that there was a lot of uh, um, people or students from around the world that didn't really know um, how to get access to the information because the libraries were closed. So, so there was a lot of uh, um, agreements with publishers. So they showed, you know, societal, yeah, yeah, whatever. They, they, they showed good uh, faith and they uh, allowed, even in Denmark, to put forward information that we normally can't subscribe for. We had a discussion in, in uh, the four of us in the little ad hoc group in Denmark where we talked about all the legal uh, textbooks they, they, it, in Danish, they're not easy to get access to on sort of a campus access. Uh, we, will, we would like to, but it's not easy because the publishers hasn't thought about how to do it right. Uh, but all of a sudden, we could actually get access in those university libraries that has to do with, you know, legal, the, educating lawyers and stuff. So, so all this has uh, has moved something uh, as I see it. So so I think that the focus on training material and open, it could be part of the open science as to come back to your question, Monique. But mm -hmm. I also think it it should actually also be focused in itself uh, because otherwise it's just something, you know, maybe forgotten in a corner of the big taxonomy of open access and open science. Yeah, 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 that's true. Um... Are there any, any more questions? Because the, I was wondering this, but uh, I can imagine uh, other people have questions too. I have a question. Uh, I have a question. Thank you, Jeanette, first of all, uh, for your presentation and all the things that you are doing on the local and the national uh, uh, level. But also internationally speaking, uh, your experience is very relevant, I think, because uh, the connections that you were able to make uh, even uh, in between uh, different institutions are very powerful um, and they they speak to the the approach of uh, open educational open education practitioners but also they speak to the larger community about uh, sharing knowledge and sharing uh, practices also um one thing that uh, um well, first of all, I learned a lot. Not being a librarian, this was very helpful for me to find uh, suggestions about things that I need to, to deepen my knowledge about. So thank you also for that. One thing that um, uh, struck my attention was the one, the moment in which you referred to the, uh, the difference between open educational resources and educational resources when they are behind the wall or a login and a password. Uh, I have a slightly different vision on this, but I think that both are true. It's not only, I mean, usually in my daily life, it, it, what matters is having a license on a resource. And then if the infrastructure is still a boundary, it doesn't matter. It will come a time when we will be able to open uh, the walls of the infrastructure. But the license is very important because uh, the resource can be also uploaded elsewhere and be really accessible to everyone. I'm thinking about MOOCs, MOOCs released with an open license. Usually to access MOOCs, even if they are released with an open license, you have to insert your login and password before accessing the content. But at the same time, um, this is not, I mean, I agree, it's not completely open. Uh, it's, a, let's say, a compromise. I think that in the in in our age these days we still have to find our ways around uh, the boundaries that uh, technology and the infrastructure or lack of policy uh, put in front of us. And I wanted to have your your vision on this because uh, I get your point of view. At the same time, in my opinion, it is somehow it's also faster to put a license on a resource. So that's what I'm fighting for. That's where I put my energies for. But I wanted to add your uh, feedback on that. Mm. that. That's where my new to OER comes in, because I think that, in my opinion, um, a MOOC that you need to log into. Yes, that's open because you can you can get an open education. You can you can be trained. You you can learn stuff. But I cannot perhaps use the context in it, my it own is released because with an there's open not a license, license for yes. it. Yeah. No, no, yes. So, 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 so there are this is what I'm thinking about. License. So there could be differences. 
Yeah, yeah, but not everyone has. So, no, so it, yes, it depends yes. on is there an open license or not. And if yes. there's not, then I then I can't. Then I have to ask you if it's your MOOC. Can I, you know, Definitely. reuse that in my own setting or something? So, 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 so this is, you know, on my learning path right now. This is what I'm sort of trying to get an idea. What can we do? Because we get these kind of questions, Casper and I, in in our copyright. What can we do with this? We want to put this MOOC forward, and then we we meet all kinds of obstacles. We meet. I mean, even for, from big publishing houses saying that we can't take a screen dump of their website because then we have to pay, you know, an amount for that. I mean, we doing that in a MOOC, for instance, to sort of communicate that this is actually a great tool, learn that or whatever, even though it's conventional or you have to pay, right? So, so all this is... This is strange to me. Uh, and I also think that some of the things that we as librarians in the DNA, we want to make sure that everyone has access to information. And that's the open part. And and because we have all this, you know, paywalled material behind our own, you know, four walls in our own campuses uh, and people who have the, you know, the magic lock in for accessing, uh, we can't share that with the small medium-sized enterprises we we at DTU as a, is, is a university that works quite closely with lots of small medium-sized enterprises they don't have a f access to all these DOIs are we then allowed to share one-on-one -on -one, you know send a PDF no we can send a DOI and then they have to pay in the other end so 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 all this has to do with how can we make sure that it's more openly in the old days we could take a photocopy I'm that old so we did that in the interlending law department I also worked at we, we took a photocopy put that in an envelope put a stamp on it and they had it maybe a week after or something we can't really do that we're not even allowed to take a copy a pdf and put that in of the electronic version and put it in an envelope and send it so so all this i mean we we need to think of it in another way i think and then that, that was just you know the, the scholarly work but but when we talk about the education work it could also benefit that we have access to to that all so after a course is ended and at DTU, as I said, we have this DTU Learn and the students have access to everything. And if they don't download that before the end of these 13 weeks, the course is sort of uh, taking, then they don't have access because then they are off to a next course. And then the material there used in the prior, it's vanished. It's it's, it's not vanished, but it, they can't access it anymore. So even within our own four walls, it's not open. It's semi-open or so, so, so how can we do that better? I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. shades of uh, of open. I always call it. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Because when when the when the course is finished, maybe you can um, ask for um, access again. But but there yeah, are but, many. But thresholds. but do people do that? I mean, they're off no. to the next, so they have forgotten all about it, and then you know so. Yeah, right. Oh, I, I okay. thought there was a question uh, on the chat, but... <laughs> See you tomorrow. Uh, Tamara is leaving. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Could be the comments. I mean, Mike, yeah, I knew Casper will not be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I, I, I don't see... Um, a question in the chat? No, but Casper just raised hands. So oh, maybe... just raised hands. Okay, yes, that's all also possible. Uh, if it's yeah, okay but... to to uh, to what, and I I I am not going to comment on Shinita's uh, slides, except to say that I think there's a really important uh, sort of legal point. You showed the slide with the um, Creative Commons licenses, and, and I I truly deeply believe that share alike and our lawyers hate it as Janetta said we are working very closely with our uh, lawyers they hate the share alike uh, things because they say it contaminates the materials that are being made but I, I really truly think that uh, that license is also open and something you should work with because that you force people to keep using these things openly the things we create on top of each other so I think that's a, a really important distinction but but i actually do have a question which i don't expect to be answered but which is maybe a thought for you guys at at um at, at, in your network um as someone who is what i know about open education resources is what i mostly want to hear from shanetta and uh, and what i read uh and mostly from people who are a bit skeptical about it 
So my question for you is, aren't we going about this, or you guys going about this, a really old fashioned way? Aren't we once again trying to create a situation where libraries and universities are sort of the holders of all this knowledge and then we disseminate it? Shouldn't our focus, especially as librarians and universities, be to teach our scientists, our educators to put the open license on right away? I mean, this wouldn't even be an issue if they themselves put CC BY licenses of their materials, because then it could be freely shared. Shouldn't that be where our focus was? Teach these guys to that work on having policies in our institutions saying, uh, well, yeah, you can teach and it's yours, but you need to share it and you need to share it with the world. Put on a Creative Commons uh, uh, CC BY or CC BY share like license on. If you were to do that, then I think you would go very much further and you wouldn't even infringe on anyone's rights because it would be the the educators themselves that, that would do it. So it's just a thought. I think we are very old school about this, making repositories and yeah, I think it's uh, not the way forward, but it's just me and I'm probably wrong on that. I think you're right, yeah. There, there should be a new deaf <laughs> from your government. <laughs> we definitely need policies for that, I believe, because if we leave it uh, on a one on one to one conversation or a few to few conversation, uh, we can continue asking uh, and advising and uh, encouraging teachers to release resources with uh, an open license. And this is certainly helpful to raise awareness, but if we want to be more effective, we really need to sit at the policy making tables and uh, make this become the default. <laughs> this is what we need, certainly. So I agree, Casper. this is very needed. Uh, at the same time, it, it's not always likely that uh, we are invited or we have the power to be sitting at the right tables. That would be very helpful anyway. So I really believe that we should continue and uh, all the actions that we take uh, bottom up, we somehow and somewhere become uh, top down. Uh, we just need to insist and to continuously ask, <laughs> I think. I think that's uh, beautiful um, to uh, the discussion and, and, uh, and the spotlight session because I, I think well, we're a bit over time uh, now. <laughs> Sorry for that. Do, do you want to add something, uh, Jeanette, or? Uh... No, not really, no. I mean, I, I've really enjoyed, I mean, it's not a fan club, but I've really enjoyed being part of this. And I'm very sorry that I promised many months ago to try to, to you know, translate the NOL toolkit, but I mean, life happens and then, yeah. So, but it will be done. Uh, so uh, we now have all the right, you know, things from Paola. So we will uh, eventually uh, translate it. And I think, and I think as, as Casper said, I hope I also said that at some of the things that I advocate, is it exactly how that they can do it easier for themselves so they are in charge of their own material. And this is what we try to train them at DTU. So, so if they can, but you know, the policy part, it's not up to me. I'm just a, sort of a, a librarian, you know, working and being, trying to help. So, so we have, have others have to, to have these kind of policies, right? So we can sow a seed and I'm not going to retire soon, so. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> You'll be back. <laughs> be Thanks back. again, uh, uh, Jeanette. Uh, we'll for... we'll be back. It's not it's not a one army. So we are <laughs> a lot of people actually talking about this also, right? So <laughs> thank you for your yeah. uh, famous uh, yeah. words. <laughs> yeah, and thank. Okay, thank you for your thank you presentation very much. Yes. And, and your answers. Yeah. Thank you.